Hello everyone, Dr. Ross back with chapter three of this GOB course. Topic today is ionic bonding and simple ionic compounds. The contents we'll look at are the octet rule, uh, the ionic versus covalent bonding, ions in general, ionic compound formulas, ionic compound nomenclature, formula mass of ionic compounds and properties of ionic compounds. Okay, so the octet rule is a rule that says that there's a stabilized arrangement formed um, or a stabilized arrangement of electrons is when you have eight electrons in, in a shell. Um, so this is a tendency of elements to want to have eight electrons in a shell. Atoms, depending on the nature, can either gain or lose electrons to maintain, to obtain the octet rule of eight electrons. So for example, you can take atom one here. Let's say atom one is a metal. Metals lose electrons. It can lose an electron to atom two. Let's say here atom two gains an electron. That means it's probably a non-metal. Uh, so there's an exchange of electrons from a metal to a non-metal, from one shell to another shell. Atom one loses an electron it forms an ion. A positive charge ion is called a cation. Atom two gains an electron, forms a negatively charged anion. And the two ions attract each other electrostatically. And you can describe this attraction using Coulomb's law, for example, where opposite charges attract. This is the bonding in ionic compounds where we clearly have ions. Alternatively, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a subsequent chapter, rather than exchanging electrons, we can simply share electrons to form a covalent compound, or we can cooperate our valence shells uh, and form a covalent compound, but more about that in another chapter. Ionic versus covalent bonding. Um, so bonding, to form a bond is the driving force behind compound formation, where a compound is a mixture of two or more different elements. The reason why elements bond is because they are more stable after they've bonded than they were before. And that's because they have achieved often uh, and they've obeyed the octet rule. So they've become isoelectronic with a noble gas. Noble gases typically have obeyed the octet rule. If you bond and are isoelectronic with a noble gas, the word isoelectronic means you have the same electron configuration. So you are mimicking the natural behavior of a noble gas by filling your valence shower and obtaining an octet of valence electrons. And the two ways that you can achieve that are via the ionic bond pathway or the covalent bond pathway which to remind you is we can either exchange electrons to do this. And you can see here in the final product, both atom A have eight electrons in the valence shell. You can see these eight gray spheres here. And atom B has eight electrons in its sphere here in its valence shell. So they have both obeyed the octet rule. The covalent compound, they share, but they both have access to eight. Uh, eight dots or eight electrons in its valence shell. Um, ionic versus covalent compounds. Uh, we've already mentioned the ionic way of doing it. So let's spend a bit more time looking at the covalent way of doing it. Um, just as a comparison. Um, there's one way to do ionic bonding. There are flavors of ways to do covalent bonding. You can share once and form single bonds. So we can see here, we have hydrogen and oxygen sharing two electrons here to form a covalent bond. We can form double bonds. Here we can see oxygen and carbon are sharing two pairs of electrons to form a double bond. 
or you can form a triple bond. So you can see here, nitrogen is forming three pairs of electrons to form a uh, triple bond. If you look closely at these diagrams, with the exception of hydrogen, which just does not have the ability to have an octet of electrons, it only has space for two electrons total. So it's an odd personnel, but all other elements have the capacity to obey the octet rule. And for the most part, they do. So if you count the electrons around each of these elements, you'll find that they sum to eight um, in the valence shell. So you can pause the video, have a close look, and convince yourself that each of these elements, with the exception of hydrogen, has uh, a full valence shell of the eight electrons. Ionic versus covalent bonding. Let's look at um, Lewis dot structures, which we use to as a method of studying the formation or the obedience of the octet rule. So we just look at period one. Again, period one's an odd one out. There's only two elements in period one, and they either have one electron as in hydrogen or two electrons as in helium. These electrons or dots or Lewis dots, these are the valence electrons. Much more um, representative of periods two and three of the main group. So we only have eight representative members of the main group. Because remember, the main groups are only um, the S and the P block groups. So groups one and two, and groups 13 through 18, respectively. So going from left to right across period two, we have one dot for lithium, two dots for beryllium, three dots for boron, four dots for carbon five for nitrogen, six for oxygen, seven for fluorine, eight for neon. And then for period three, we have one for sodium, two for magnesium, three for aluminum, four for silicon, five for phosphorus, six for sulfur, seven for chlorine, eight for argon. The benefit of having periods two and three are you can look down the period, down the group on group one, you can see that both lithium and sodium have one dot. So they have a family trend of one valence electron. And that's why they're both in uh, the same group in the periodic table. Brillium and magnesium both have two dots. Boron and aluminum both have three. Carbon and silicon both have four, etc. So let's look at our first example. Sodium with its one dot and chlorine with its seven. Well, sodium wants to get rid of its, of its dot here so that its valence shell only has one dot. It wants to shed its shell so that its core shell is already full. By definition, it's a full core shell. It would then become the valence shell. So there's an exchange of an electron. Sodium loses and it acquires a positive charge. The red dot of sodium goes here to chlorine. Chlorine now has eight dots and acquires a negative charge. And the oppositely charged ions come together to form an ionic bond. Magnesium and oxygen can do likewise. Magnesium can interact twice with oxygen, shed both of its valence electrons to acquire a plus two charge. Oxygen can now pick up those extra two electrons it needs to fill its valence shell acquire a negative two charge, and the ions come together to form an ionic bond. Calcium and chlorine can do the same, but while chlorine can only take one electron, calcium has two to donate. So we need two chlorines, each one taking one of calcium's electron. So we have a two to one ratio of calcium and chlorine uh, necessary so that all electrons are accounted for. This final example here shows uh, with arrows shown the detail. So magnesium coming together with bromine. Bromine only has a space for one electron. So we need two bromines to take the electrons of magnesium. One goes to the bromine on the left. The other goes to the bromine on the right. Therefore, we have two bromines and ultimately our ionic compound has magnesium and bromine in a one to two definite proportion. So remember Joseph Proust 
more of definite proportions. So I like to say this is a one to two Joseph Proust definite proportion of this compound. Ions. Um, we've said typically nonmetals form ions. Um, essentially, the charge of a nonmetal, the ionic charge of a nonmetal is going to be negative because you acquire electrons. How many electrons you acquire depends on how close you are away from the noble gases. So again, the goal is to fulfill a valence shell of eight electrons. The halogens form halides by acquiring one electron and therefore form a negative charge, a uh, single negative charge. Uh, oxygen and things like sulfur and nitrogen and phosphorus, they for oxygen, it's two electrons away from a full shell. So it will acquire a negative two charge as it adopts a full shell. Sulfur the same. Nitrogen and phosphorus are three electrons away from a full shell. So they will acquire a three negative charge in the process of acquiring a full shell of eight electrons. Um, we have metals will form positively charged ions. Sodium and potassium are both in group one. So they will shed one electron in order to have, in order to promote that core shell below the valence shell to a valence shell. Uh, so they would move left to right and then wrap around to get the previous layer, the previous shell's noble gas structure. Um, things like calcium and barium in group two, they are two electrons away from shedding their shell. So they get rid of two electrons, they adopt a positive two charge. Um, elements in the D block or the P block, it, de it can depend, it gets a bit more complicated. And I think we'll talk about that in another video. Um, polyatomic ions, this is ions where you have more than one element with a charge spread over it. And we're just gonna have to memorize those. Uh, I'll itemize some of them later on in these slides, uh, but you're just gonna have to memorize some commonly encountered polyatomic ions. Here is the list I'll provide. Uh, these are some common polyatomic ions. So for example, a carbonate ion, formal formula CO3 two minus, this is a carbon three oxygens and over the entire structure, there's a negative two charge. Uh, nitrate formula NO3 minus. This is a nitrogen three oxygens and spread over the entire structure is a negative charge. So you're, these are some common ions that by no means is this exhaustive, but you would be well served to memorize uh, these as examples of common ions. Locating them inside the periodic table, you can see that group one elements, they form a plus one charge because they want to, for example, lithium is going to lose its valence electron, wrap around and become isoelectronic with helium. Sodium is going to lose its valence electron, wrap around and become isoelectronic with neon, obey the octet rule. Rubidium here in period five is going to lose its valence electron wrap around to become isoelectronic with krypton, etc. Magnesium going to lose two electrons, wrap around to become isoelectronic with neon. Um, fluorine is going to gain an electron, form a negative one charge in the process to become isoelectronic with neon. Bromine gain an electron, form is become isoelectronic with krypton. Um, there are special cases in the D block here. We'll refer to that later. They're special because you can often form a multiple of charges and which multiple is formed um, will really depend on what the counter charge is. Notice there are four elements that, other than the main group elements, 
they can only form one type of charge. That in itself is worth remembering. So zinc can only form a plus two charge. Silver, AG, can only form a plus one charge. Cadmium, CD, can only form a plus two charge. Aluminum, AL, can only form a plus two charge. It's well worth remembering those four elements uh, as alternatives to other elements that are close by them, whereas they can only form one single type of charge. Writing the ionic compounds, we write them as you see them in the periodic table. We write the metal that forms the plus charge first, and we write the non-metal that forms the negative charge last. And we want to add them so that the ratios that they have multiplied by the charges sums to a zero net charge. So for example, lithium and fluoride ions come together in a one-to-one -one Joseph Proust definite proportion because a plus one and a minus one sums to zero. So we have a neutral ionic compound. In contrast, barium and phosphide come together in a three to two Joseph Proust definite proportion because you have a plus two charge on barium, a negative three charge on phosphide, and two and three don't sum together to make zero initially, but two and three both factor into six. So to make a plus two charge six, you scale it by three. So we get this multiple of three here. To make a negative three charge six, we scale it by two. So you get this three to two Joseph Proust definite proportion here. Nomenclature, we follow the IUPAC, which is an acronym standing for, um, I believe, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists. Uh, the COOL Club, you can also call it. And we're gonna identify different names. Essentially for us, there's gonna be type one ionic compounds, uh, which have a non-variable charge type two ionic compounds, which have a variable charge, uh, covalent compounds, and then acids and bases. Give me one second to send a message. Okay, so let's, let's have a look. So for example, type one ionic compounds, these are typically S block methyl ionic compounds. The metal only has one type of charge. So for example, sodium sulfate, we've memorized that sulfate has a negative two charge. We know sodium can only form a plus one charge. Therefore we need two sodiums to counterbalance the negative two charge on the sulfate. Zinc chloride, we know that chloride has a negative one charge and there are two of them. We know that zinc can only form a plus two charge. So I only need one zinc to counterbalance the negative two charges provided by the two chlorides. Type two, we can have a choice of charge. So here we see the, uh, the addition of stock notation or uh, also known that also these Roman numerals, they're known as stock notation. Sulfide has a negative two charge and there are three of them. So that total is a negative six charge. I only have two ions. So each one must have a plus three charge. So the two of them will counterbalance the negative six charge of three sulfides. To let you know that I have an ion with a three charge on it, I write ion three sulfide rather than just ion sulfide. So I specify the charge in a type two ionic compound. Here, lead to nitrate. Nitrate has a negative one charge and there are two of them. So the single lead must have a plus two charge. So I communicate that by writing lead two, where the Roman numeral two, the stock notation, tells you the charge on the lead ion. Covalent compounds here, we need prefixes. So if I have N2O4, that's two nitrogens and four oxygens. So two nitrogens is dinitrogen, four oxygens is tetroxide. The prefix tetra means four oxide, 
just reminds you it's not just oxygen alone. So it's four oxygens, tetroxide. Sulfur hexafluoride, this is one sulfur and six uh, fluorides. So hexa is the prefix for six. And there's a table of prefixes that you would learn. Mono is one, di is two, tri is three, tetra is four, penta is five, hexa is six, hepta is seven, octa is eight, nona is nine, and deca is 10. But you can find a list of that in your textbook. Acids can be complicated. Um, typically for us, you can tell an acid because its first element is a hydrogen. Uh, at least that's good enough for what we need to do. So for example, we know that HCl is probably an acid because its first element is hydrogen. H2S is probably an acid because its first element is hydrogen. So we typically have binary and oxo acids. Uh, so if it is uh, a, bin a binary acid, uh, we would take the ide of the iron, um, and that becomes the hydro, whatever the iron is, ic acid. So for example, um, if the, so for example, HCl of this were an acid, it would be the chloride iron. So it would be hydrochloric acid. The hydro, which is because the first element is hydrogen. Um, this example here, this HOCl, um, the OCl is the hypochlorite ion. So the hypochlorite ion would become hypochlorous acid. Uh, something like HClO4 here. This is the perchlorate ion, so this would become the perchloric acid. Um, I'll likely have a separate video on naming acids. This is just in passing, the first time we've seen naming. This is a nice flow chart that can be helpful. Uh, I think eventually the goal is to or organically be able to name elements, sorry, to be able to name compounds. But initially, you can follow these flow charts. Flow charts, in my opinion, always look more complicated. Your brain, once you get used to them, can kind of do the flow chart naturally, so to speak, without the need for the flow chart. Formula masses or molar masses, this is the mass of the thing, whatever it is you're looking at, whether it be an element or a compound. So we take the object uh, and we say that whatever the mass of the object is in atomic mass units, just replace the unit atomic mass unit with gram. And by definition, that's a mole. So that becomes the mass of one mole. So for example, if we have copper two phosphate, chemical formula shown here, then we have three coppers. So we have three moles of copper. The 63.546 here, this is from the periodic table. This is the atomic mass shown in the periodic table. We convert that to gram just by putting the word, the symbol G after it. And by definition, that's one mole. So this is the molar mass of copper in our sample. We've got two phosphorus. We do the same type of calculation for phosphorus. And we have two multiplied by four, which is eight oxygen. We do the same for oxygen. We can add those up. We get this total grand mass for copper three phosphate. And this is the mass of one mole of copper three phosphate. Some properties of ionic compounds, they tend to be brittle. And that's because each constituent ion has a label of either a plus or a minus charge. So for example, if we take this uh, cartoon version of sodium chloride here. We've got the sodium cations in gray. We've got the chloride anions in green. And every plus charge is neighboring a negative charge. 
if we apply a shear force, like with a hammer, for example, we can physically move some of those charges. And here the cartoon shows that we've hit this thing, obviously on the right over here. We've now shifted the right side down. And now we've got two light charges. Well, this is gonna cause a repulsion and this can lead to a crack or a fracturing right down uh, the ionic compound. So this is why ionic compounds tend to crack. So for example, dishes crack when you hit them, rocks crack when you hit them. They can be strong, they typically are, but they can be brittle, easily crack. Ionic compounds can conduct an electric current. So for example, if you take distilled water over on the left, it's just covalent compounds of water. They don't have a charge. So when they move, they don't carry an electric current. Um, so here the cartoon shows the light bulb doesn't glow because the battery wants to light the light bulb, but the water can't close the circuit by flowing an electric charge. If we put a solid ionic compound in here, so just dig the electrodes into a piece of ionic compound, the ions are not free. They can't move between the electrodes. So again, no current flows. If we dissolve the ions in water, we now have free ions which can move, close the circuit, and now the electric, uh, the electricity turns the light bulb on. So ionic compounds can conduct an electric current if they dissolve in water. Just in, sum in summary, some properties of ionic compounds compared to covalent compounds. Ionic compounds tend to be high melting solids. Uh, they tend, they can be soluble in water, many are. Some are not though. When they are soluble in water, they tend to conduct an electric current. Um, they tend not to be soluble in organic solvents. Uh, when you dissolve them or you heat them so high that they are molten, so they are free to move, they can conduct electricity. And that concludes this video.